Welcome back to our APM project management series where we are looking at the PFQ, that's the Project Fundamentals Qualification from APM. Uh, and this is designed for anybody who's looking to sit that PFQ exam or just wants to get some fundamental project management skills under their belt to help them with workplace or in your personal life. In this video, quite a short one this one, we're going to be looking at the project roles. So all of the people that are involved and what, their, what our expectations is of them throughout this project. So first of all, let's talk about this governance board. Now, if you studied APM before, you may have heard this called as the sponsor board, the steering group, the project board. In the seventh edition, that's now referred to as the governance board. Uh, I've kept project board on there because that, uh, that's my speak and that's how I like to think of them. And these are generally your senior managers. Um, they may be directors of the company. They may be representatives of the client whose overall job is to own and look after the strategic nature of our project. But we'll go more into their duties as we go on. One member of that governance board gets the lovely title of being the sponsor, the project sponsor. They are directly responsible for ensuring that that project is viable and is delivered appropriately and delivering those benefits. So we have a project sponsor, key person. Now directly reporting to that sponsor is the project manager. So you, the person who is actually running that project is actually doing the hard work and making sure that happens. So the project manager in essence is going to do all of the planning of how to turn the idea into reality and then managing the team to ensure that that reality actually comes true. So talking of which, our next group of people is that project team so the team members of that project who are doing all of the things that the project manager has asked them to do following those plans and our last key people in this chain is the end users so these are the people who are going to operate the products that come out of our project so they may be moving into the new building, they may be operating the new process, they may be using the new machinery, it might be that they are the ones who have to interact with customers through that web interface. Whatever the results are of this project, the end users, they are the ones who are going to be directly impacted by the project. And once the project's been completed, it will become their business as usual to operate these products. So that's our general flow governance board. Make sure everything is done properly and it's going to be uh, it's strategically aligned to the business objectives. One member of those is the sponsor who's given direct responsibility for the whole journey. The project manager who is the one who actually does stuff and gets everything done. The team members who are doing those tasks under the direction of that project manager and then the end users, the ones who have to live with those results, the good, the bad and the ugly. Now, there are a few other bits that we should mention uh, when it comes to these members of these teams, one of which is the fact that these end users will often feed back to members of the governance board directly. And there can be conversations between especially key end users, such as if you've got an external client that you're dealing with, they're an end user, but they will also potentially be part of the governance board as well. So they'll be involved in those high level conversations. And we need those end users to be feeding back certain information to the governance board. So the governance board can ensure that what's being done throughout the project remains fit for purpose, remains um, operationally uh, compliant with the rules and regulations that we've put in place. Two other groups of people we need to mention before we look at any of these in detail. There could be a product owner as part of your project team as well. Now I say could be because there is absolutely no guarantees that there will be somebody who fits this role, um, but absolutely they are effectively part of the project team but they're a bit of a specialist sometimes they are external to your organization and they're actually a member of the client organization rather than yours but they join the project team as a product owner we'll look at exactly what that means in a little bit 
any other group of people that you may or may not have as part of your project is a project management office called the PMO. Now essentially this is a group of administrative type people who are there to support the project. They're not directly team members because they are not directly completing tasks for the project but they're providing a whole range of support services for those team members and for the project manager themselves. Depending on your organisation, you may not have access to a project management office. You may not have, depending on your project, a product owner. And for some products, you might find that your, sorry, some projects, you might find that your project team members consists of just you. Uh, and I've certainly run many, many projects where the sponsor has been my line manager. I'm the project manager. I'm also the team members. There is no project management office, there is no product owner, and I'm dealing directly with the end users. And if you think a video or two back, we've talked about a couple of examples of things like building a shed, you can see that some projects, while we might have lots of integrity about the way we go about them, there's actually very few people involved. There's not a product owner, there's not a project management office. You might be the end user of your own project for something like a shed. Uh, a wedding, yes, more people, but again, you're going to be limited on those different roles. But we're talking about the theory here, uh, and in more complex projects, workplace projects, we may well have all of these people involved. So let's look a bit closer at each of these roles and what their responsibilities actually are. Okay, so this governance board then, so they're in charge of governance, so overall strategic uh, definition of the processes that should be followed, the rules that we need to abide by when we're delivering our project, and the documentation we're going to use. So that could be they are defining how we report certain things. It must be in this format. We must do it this frequency. This is how we track risks. This is how we procure stuff for our projects. So they have a lot of say over the way that we do things. They will also make sure that the project is following an agreed structure. So if we have the organization has a set way of doing things, their job is to make sure the project managers are following those rules. They're going to make sure that we have good, rigorous quality management in process. They're going to have uh, the powers of effective decision making. So being able to start or stop a project to okay certain ideas or to say no to other ideas. One thing that they are really importantly involved in is the fact that they're representatives of people impacted by the project activities. So they've got people in your organization who are trying to do their business as usual activities and this project is going to be disruptive. It might be pulling people from teams, from their BAU, their business as usual activities, in order to do project tasks, which might be taking them away from front counters, customer interactions, and things like that. The governance board needs to represent those staff that are going to be impacted, those suppliers, those customers, and make sure that the project isn't too disruptive, isn't actually causing more problems than it's solving. Uh, they're also going to be in charge of looking at the business case. So we're going to look at the business case in the next video. But that business case, which is, a, uh, is an argument about why we should or should not undertake a particular project. So their job is to make sure that that idea can be translated into a positive business outcome. And finally, they are there to make sure that this project is going to receive the funding and resources it needs in order to be delivered. It doesn't matter how good you are at your job as a project manager, you've got the best plans in place you could have if there's no budget allocated for it, or you're not getting support with the staff that you need to be able to deliver that. So the governance board are that high level strategic positioning where they're able to support you with all of those things. Now remember, project sponsor, which is our next person, they're a member of that governance board, but they are singled out to take specific responsibilities with regard to this specific project. 
So their job, monitoring the project environment and business case. In our first video of this series, we talked about the project environment, we talked about PESL. So one of the important things that sponsor is doing is keeping an eye to see if any of those environmental things change. Maybe there is an economic change, a legal change. They will be able to keep an eye on that, notify the governance board, but also the project team of those changes and be able to discuss options of how we can adjust to uh, to ensure positive outcomes still. Uh, they're the arbiter of stakeholder and user requirements. Requirements is a special word we're using where we have end users who may be saying we want it to do this, 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 this and this. Not all of which may be possible or there might be conflicting demands. These people want the button on the left. Those people want the button on the right. The project sponsor arbitrates those kind of decisions to come up with a, a final. This is what we're doing. So the project manager can focus on delivery, not on deciding what needs to be done. They will also determine those priorities with regard to cost, time and quality. In the previous video, we talked about cost, time and quality. Pick any two. You can have it on time to the right quality, but the chances are it's going to cost more than you wanted to. We talked a little bit about that equilibrium. Ultimately, the sponsor is the one who is going to agree on what that equilibrium is and whether we take longer, but it comes in cheaper. We reduce quality so that we can be on time without going over budget, etc. They will also keep the senior management team involved, in, informed and involved with what's going on. So that's not necessarily that governance board, but it could be other managers across the organisation just so they're aware of what's happening uh, and how that may or may not impact their teams. They will support the project manager. And this is a really, really important point that sometimes you don't see happening in real world environments. The sponsor's job is to support that project manager, which means when the project manager's got questions or gets stuck or isn't sure of what the best way to do things or whether it's in line with the company vision, the sponsor is the one who should be providing that support and guidance and resources, whatever is required. So again, the project manager can crack on with delivering the project itself. We mentioned business case already and that governing board their job is to make sure that that business case makes sense but the sponsor is the person within that board specifically assigned to make sure that that business case is developed so that does not necessarily mean they sit down and write it themselves but they own it they have ownership over that business case so they are responsible for making sure that it is written and that it is accurate and that it is covered everything that needs to be considered for this project so that a sensible decision on viability can be made. They're also going to be involved in high level progress monitoring of the project. What that means is the project manager and some other sources will report into the sponsor about progress, about problems, budgets, timelines and all of those things so that the project sponsor can monitor the project at quite a high level, make sure it's on time, on budget, remains compliant we're hitting those quality targets and if we encounter problems and it looks like we are not going to be able to deliver on time on budget and on quality potentially terminating that project and making that decision of it's not worth carrying on so our next role then is us that project manager person and our role within this as a very very central person within the whole of the project structure so we are going to provide those updates those progress updates to the sponsor and to management of time cost quality where are we are we compliant are we on track have we overspent etc we are going to be the ones who actually define and plan the project itself and we're going to produce something called the pmp that's the project management plan that is going to say, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is how long it's going to take. This is how much it's going to cost. Here's how we know that it's going to do the right thing. Um, and it's going to combine all of those together. That Then the project sponsor is going to be able to look at that plan 
and make a decision and say yes this is viable it's a good plan we can get that money together that time frame is suitable yes there's no problem with compliance issues the disruptions to business as usual activity are acceptable the impact on our customers and clients is acceptable let's go ahead with that project or alternatively push back to say you need to make amendments so assuming that plan is kind of accepted we're going to be managing the expectations of our project sponsor as well as our end users because we sit in that lovely position between those two uh, those two sets of people with competing and conflicting ideas and wants and needs and requirements we're going to be building and leading and motivating our team who are actually doing those tasks they are building the thing they are writing the document they are testing the stuff whatever it may be we need to lead that team to ensure they are doing the right job on time on budget with minimal risk to the quality requirements we have so monitoring and controlling that progress really important to ensure that we can deliver on time on cost and to quality we're going to take uh, undertake reviews as part of that so we're going to be looking at each section of our project how is that section doing is it on time is it on cost is it on quality what problems are there what problems could there be uh, what can we do about them and solving a lot of those problems as we go and we are that primary contact for that wider team so for end users and our team and our sponsor and our product owner if we have one and the project management office if we have one so lots of lots of communicating with different people all over the place so project management is this interesting mix of strong planning and management skills along with strong stakeholder communication and leadership skills so it's quite a unique role in the fact that you've got to be a people person and a paper person at the same time okay our next role is our project team so remember these are the people who answer directly to the project manager for the purposes of the project and their job is to make sure they keep communication lines open and speaking with their stakeholders which includes end users suppliers contractors the project manager themselves the product owner if you have one and the project management office again if you have one they will identify and take ownership of any risks within their area of the project and hopefully identify any risks even if it's outside of that area of the project more eyes and more brains the better when it comes to risk management more people able to spot potential problems and come up with potential solutions they're going to obviously they're actually going to complete their individual work packages but they're also going to contribute to the progress evaluations by reporting back to the project manager on successes delays uh, issues and things like that uh, and really important and this is where the leadership part comes in and building your team effectively is we want them to be helping the project manager solve problems if you've been in a leadership role uh, or a management role previously for any reason you will know that your best team members are the ones who come to you with solutions rather than just telling you there's a problem and leaving you to deal with it so we want that team saying hey look this has gone a bit wonky we can do this or we can do that which would you like me to do that's ideally what we'd like so our project team they're basically the doers they're going to do all of the stuff uh, and communicate and report on that stuff as well really important that we've got a good strong project team okay our end users uh, sometimes the bane of a project manager's life is the end users um, so they are there to provide expert guidance on um, what is needed how it needs to function what it needs to do etc they're going to identify any constraints or dependencies so what we mean by there is it absolutely has to be able to do x if it can't do that you might as well not bother so that might be a constraint around we've only got x amount of money to spend on this it might be it has to be done by this deadline or it's not worth doing at all 
it could be it has to produce a file in a particular format that integrates well with another system because if it doesn't integrate again there's no point in doing the project so they might put some of those things in place part of that they're identifying those project requirements uh, and it might be you know we want it to have our corporate colors we want it to be able to do this we want our customers to be able to do this with it um, whatever that might be all of those requirements that the project manager is going to have to take into account when they're actually planning the project and your team members are going to have to take into account when they're actually doing those tasks at the end of the day once our project's completed remember these are the people who are going to be taking forward the product the results of our project into the real real world as part of their business as usual activities so of course they are going to have a vested interest in making sure this project is successful and they get as many of their own requirements in it as they possibly can. They are, because it's going to impact their way forward, it's going to obviously change their way of operating, it's going to change their BAU. But during the project, they may have other changes going on from other projects and programs or just continuous improvement processes and the end users do need to keep the project team informed to say hey by the way there's just been a software update and it's changed it like this this may impact what you're trying to do or we've changed this process we've expanded our customer base we now have an international shipping um, facility Whatever it could be, we need to keep the project team involved because they need to make changes to it. So my experience, one of the biggest challenges in project management is um, end users not being clear on what they want and a lot of competition between end users um, about their requirements. Now remember, the project sponsor and that governing board, part of their job is to arbitrate and have those conversations and decide what requirements we're actually going to take forward or not. In the real world, sometimes you don't get that support. So as the project manager, you end up sitting in meetings for potentially hours on end where people are arguing what they want. And you think, why am I sitting here listening to this? I need you guys to decide what you want. And then once you've got a consensus, then tell me. I'm not interested in your arguments over what color it needs to be or where the button should be. Sort that out amongst yourselves, then tell me. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work the way I would like. Okay, so what's our next group of people? So our project management office. Now remember, again, these are not necessarily available to you within your organization, but if they are, um, they have some very specific roles they need to do. Remember, they are not part of the direct project team. They are not completing work packages and tasks towards our final product but they will help with things like collecting and presenting progress information so they may be liaising with finance department what's been invoiced how much have we been charged for that and getting all of that kind of information and keeping that uh, you know keeping that updated and available for the project manager they are often experts in best practice and they can advise and guide on certain processes such as procurement and recruitment, uh, supplier selection and things like that. And they can be called upon to support the project manager within those kind of bounds. There's a good chance that they're going to be involved in some kind of auditing and reviews. Uh, so rather than the whole organization just trusting one project manager when they say, of course I'm doing a great job, it will be fine, they're actually conducting some independent reviews of what's going on um, and checking those things and going, well, is the reports we're getting actually accurate? Now, that sounds like they're watching your back, but when you consider that you might be spending a significant amount of money, it's important the organization is comfortable that you've got this under control. They will also deal with lots of things like information management, dealing with all their data, collating stuff, collating feedback and reports, risk assessments, all of those kind of things they may well be doing for you. And they will provide any specialist report uh, support that you might need. So this could be things like um, 
Excel skills to be able to crunch data for you. It could be that they've got estimating skills, quantity surveyors, people like that could be part of that project management office, which is a shared resource of people available across the organization that you can access for specific things. Now, our last one that we need to look at for this is this product owner. It's a slightly odd one, um, and many projects don't have a product owner. Uh, in the seventh edition, they have tightened up a bit what they're referring to as project uh, product owner. In previous versions of the APM material, it's been very loose and it's been difficult to understand what they're talking about here. But what we now get from APM is the fact that this person is an expert that may be part of our own organization or may be part of the client organization. The point is they're an expert in their field, in their particular area, um, and they have a deep understanding of the needs of the client, so the stakeholders. They will provide feedback on things like the priorities and constraints on an ongoing basis. They will lead specific product development so your product might have a your project might have a whole bunch of things it's producing and they may be an expert in one particular area they will conduct lots of stakeholder communication so between the end users which may or may not be an external client um, but also within your project team and they will act as that expert intermediary so i think the easiest way to to talk about this is to put this into context of a project so one of the people that I've worked with directly works for the MOD and part of their job as a project manager is working on updates for particular types of helicopter. Now, I'm not going to give you any more details than that, but as the project manager, they are not a helicopter pilot uh, and they are not a helicopter engineer or mechanic. They're a project manager. And while they've got a reasonably good understanding of the engineering involved, they're not a specialist. The client is the MOD directly themselves and they're dealing with officers but again those officers are not pilots of those helicopters they're not fixing those helicopters themselves in fact they're not even sitting in those helicopters so their understanding of the ultimate need of the project is strong but they do not have any detailed knowledge. So in that case they assign somebody who would be a product owner who knows those helicopters inside and out they're either a pilot or a mechanic possibly both and they're going to be able to talk about the real intricate details about what will work what won't work to do with weights to do with where the pilot sits where instrument panels are and all of those things that they can provide that absolute expert knowledge that is required for the rest of the project team to be able to do its job properly Okay, that brings us to the end of our project roles. So there's not that many of them. Uh, and of course, every project is different. Those project teams are going to be big or small, depending on your project. Your project board, your uh, governance board, uh, may be very effective or they may be pretty much non-existent. So again, in the real world, one of the biggest challenges as project managers we have is the sponsor doesn't understand their role and what their job is. And the governance board either doesn't really exist or they don't understand their role within it. And that can be one of the most frustrating things for us trying to run a project is we go to our project sponsor for support and they look at us blankly and go, well, you're the project manager, you sort it out because they don't understand that they actually have a very important role in supporting us and making decisions. But of course, this is about APM and this is about the prepping for the exam. So that's the information you need to know. Just bear in mind that in the real world, it doesn't always work in that nice structured way because anything that involves people will throw you a bit of a, <laughs> a bit of a curveball every now and then. Hope you found this one useful. In the next video, we'll be looking specifically at that business case, right at the beginning of the project. What is it we want to do and why do we want to do it? And then justifying spending our money and time, blood, sweat and tears in taking that project forward. I hope this has been useful for you. I'll see you in the next one.